Good morning, my name is Dr. Rachel Alinsky and I'm an assistant professor of pediatrics at Johns Hopkins University, um, where I do adolescent medicine and addiction medicine. I'm happy to be speaking to you this morning about um, how do we work towards improving systems of care for youth with substance use disorders. So the learning objectives for today are that after attending this lecture, you'll be able to describe the current system of treatment for adolescent substance use disorders in the United States and recognize gaps and needs in the adolescent substance use disorder treatment system. First, I'll start with an introduction, then go into some treatment for youth with substance use disorders, talk about my research looking into the gaps of care, and then finally finish up with a wrap up. I wanted to begin with this slide on language and stigma because substance use and addiction have historically been viewed as moral failings and stigmatizing language reflecting this bias view is commonly used. This has contributed to health disparities for people of racial and ethnic minorities in addition to all individuals with substance use disorders. Clinical terminology now is shifting towards understanding addiction as a medical disorder and not a moral failure. And Research has shown that stigmatizing language really negatively impacts community members, but also healthcare providers' perceptions of people who use substances, leading to actual worse healthcare delivery. And so I'd encourage all of you to think about not using the words on the left side of the screen, so drug abuse, abuser, addict, clean or dirty urines, and instead use the medically accurate person-first language. So talk about substance use disorders or a person with a substance use disorder. Talk about the test being negative or positive rather than clean and people being in recovery. And changing language is just one step towards decreasing stigma, but I think an important one to begin with. So addiction. So from the beginning of my medical training, really, I began seeing patients with addiction on the wards. I was taking care of people with opioid overdoses, alcoholic hepatitis, cocaine, myocardial infarctions, and I was struck by the extreme number of deaths due to opioid overdose. This is in the United States, um, rising up to over 47,000 per year while I was in my residency. But what struck me even more were the patients using substances that I was seeing on the pediatric side of things who were also coming in with overdoses. And I realized that among the individuals in the United States that are dying of opioid overdose every year, 4,000 of them are adolescents and young adults. I also learned from my own patients and also from the research that most adults with substance use disorder started using as adolescents. And this graph is just one example showing the very young age of substance use initiation among young adults being treated for um, addiction. I also learned that the younger that someone tries a substance, such as alcohol or opioids, the higher risk they have of becoming addicted due to the developing adolescent brain and the reward pathways that make youth more susceptible to developing addiction. And I wanted to just give you a snapshot of some of the patients that I've seen even in the last year during my work in adolescent medicine right now, um, just to think about what are some of the gaps in the care system. And we'll come back to these at the end. So I've seen a 17-year-old female who's had repeated hospitalizations for cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, and the family really just smokes together. 16-year-old female in the pediatric ICU with a polysubstance overdose, really no parental supervision at home, and there's no inpatient or residential treatment available in the state of Maryland. This is a picture of Maryland um, where we're located. There's a 20-year-old male with end-stage renal disease, and he's already had a kidney transplant, but now has had rejection of that kidney from medication adherence in the setting of multiple substance use disorders. An 18-year-old male with depression, PTSD, and he's smoking 15 blunts of marijuana daily, not really doing too much else right now um, in terms of working or school. A 23-year-old male who's finally starting buprenorphine for the first time after having had multiple overdoses, detox admissions, and witnessing friends die. And a 16-year-old male in the pediatric ICU with a polysubstance overdose who mom is hesitant to force into treatment. So I'll come back to these at the end as we'll think about kind of throughout the rest of this presentation, what are some of the you know, failings that we've had for these youth? So now we'll talk a little bit about what treatment is available for youth with substance use disorders. 
So I often frame these thoughts when thinking about the levels of prevention. And here we have the kind of progression from substance initiation in adolescence through the development of substance use disorder, and then onto severe substance use disorder in adulthood. And so we think about primary prevention that's really working at before individuals actually even begin to use substances. Most of my work is focused on secondary prevention, which is once these adolescents are already using, what can we do to kind of prevent them from reaching that severe substance use disorder stage in adulthood. So this is screening, treatment, working on stigma, kind of keeping in mind developmental perspective. And tertiary prevention at the other end of things is really working on harm reduction for individuals with the most severe um, addiction. And this also applies to adolescents as well. Another helpful framework for thinking about treatment of youth with substance use disorders is the Opioid Use Disorder Cascade of Care, which has been adapted from the HIV Cascade of Care. And this is where we can think about how do we bring youth um, with opioid use disorder through diagnosis, engagement in care, initiation of meds, ultimately towards recovery. I also think that the socio-ecological model is a helpful framework for thinking about the level of intervention. Is it individual focus, organizational or community, or is it a policy intervention that can have wide reaching impacts? So let me start by talking about the continuum of care that exists for adolescent substance use disorder treatment. And this is from the American Society of Addiction Medicine um, that talks about the different levels of care. So we begin over here with early intervention, and these are services that are focused really in the primary care office and schools, social services, may include prevention efforts, and it also includes interventions that are um, targeted at youth who are at risk because of exposure to substances. Maybe they begin with experimentation or use, but they don't yet have a diagnosable substance use disorder. We then come to outpatient services, and this is really the most common frequent level of care. And this can be the initial step in someone's treatment or a step down from a more intensive treatment setting. And oftentimes this allows individuals to work on practicing therapeutic goals in a home setting. It's useful for youth that are in an early stage of change that are not really yet committed to going into further treatment. And it allows you to engage these youth in treatment, enhance their motivation and prepare them for potentially more intensive treatment services. During the outpatient services, you might be also working on relapse prevention and strengthening protective factors. So the next level of care is intensive outpatient and partial hospital services where youth are living at home but receiving really intensive structured programming. The intensive outpatient or IOP is when it's about 6 to 16 hours a week of this programming often after school or on weekends and the partial hospital is usually greater than 20 hours a week of programming that's daily or near daily and this is really helpful for adolescents with more unstable emotional or behavioral problems. And if there's a very good stable structured home environment this intensity can be very close to residential treatment if the parents are also um, at home providing a lot of support. The next level of care is residential services, and there's three levels of this. The first is really halfway houses and group homes that are staffed 24 hours a day with more structure and support, um, but they're usually receiving level one or two treatment elsewhere concurrently. The next level is what we typically think of when we think of residential programs where you go and live there for an extended period of time. Um, and there's the focus on treatment of their substance use disorder and other behavioral problems. And this is often helpful for youth that aren't really ready to change yet. Um, and the last level is medically managed residential services where they can do detoxification, um, titrate psychopharmacologic meds, and do high intensity behavioral therapy. And lastly, we have medically managed inpatient services, and this is where full inpatient medical and psychiatric care is available with nursing and medical care. And this is usually when someone comes in in an emergency with like an overdose and are admitted to the I wanted to briefly talk about payment for addiction treatments, and so I'm going to be talking about some of the different payment options later on. So Medicaid is the public health insurance program for people with low income in the United States. It covers about 20% of Americans, 40% of those under the age of 18, and about 38% of individuals with opioid use disorder. So it's a partnership between the state and federal level, and because of the Affordable Care Act, states can choose to expand their enrollment beyond the groups that would typically be covered. So they can choose to cover 
low income childless adults, which are not necessarily covered in every state Medicaid plan. And Medicaid is really important for addiction coverage um, because adults with opioid use disorder who have Medicaid are twice as likely to receive treatment compared to those that are privately insured. And you'll see here on this graph that among those adults with opioid use disorder who receive any treatment in the last year, over half of them um, are covered by Medicaid, which is a huge payer for the addiction services. Medicaid right now covers buprenorphine and naltrexone in every state, um, but only methadone in about four fifths of states. So let me talk a little bit about gaps in care and some of the research that I've done. First, I'll walk you through um, a study that I did that was published in JAMA Pediatrics, where I looked at the receipt of addiction treatment after opioid overdose among Medicaid-enrolled adolescents and young adults. And this was also featured in the um, NIH director's blog. So as I showed you earlier, about 4,000 individuals, um, youth under the age of 25, died of an opioid overdose every year. And so non-fatal opioid overdoses seem like a critical touch point where youth who are not in treatment but in need of treatment could be you know, brought into treatment. So guidelines recommend that both youth and adults with opioid use disorder should receive medication. And research has shown that after overdose, about 16% of adults receive medications within a month and 30% with a year. However, before this, youth treatment, youth treatment received after opioid overdose was unknown. So my study aims were to identify the characteristics of youth who experience a non-fatal opioid overdose and the differences between those with heroin versus other opioid overdose, as well as determine the percentage and characteristics of youth who receive the recommended treatment with medication within 30 days of an overdose. And if we're thinking about the cascade of care, we're really looking at the steps here where you're engaging in care and starting on medication. So I performed a retrospective cohort study using Medicaid claims data from 16 U.S. states covering 4 million youth. And I was interested in those youth who had had an opioid-related overdose, either in the hospital or emergency department. And these were classified as either heroin or other opioids, and fentanyl was likely categorized within the heroin category. And for the outcome, I looked at whether they received timely receipt of treatment within 30 days of their overdose, consisting of either behavioral health services alone or medication for opioid use disorder, including buprenorphine, methadone, or naltrexone, either alone or in combination with the behavioral health services. And what I found was that there was 3,908 youth who experienced an incident opioid overdose during this time period, with about 26% heroin overdoses and other opioid overdoses comprising the rest. The median age was 18, 60% were female, 65% non-Hispanic white. The crude incident opioid overdose rate was 44 per 100,000 person years. And I found that the risk of recurrent overdose was 2.6 times higher among the youth who had had an incident heroin overdose compared to other opioids. And we can see here in the Kaplan-Meier curve that youth who had had a heroin overdose, those in blue, experienced a recurrent overdose at a much higher rate. And then when it comes to the primary outcome, the timely treatment by age, what I found was this first column over here in the left, that over the overall sample, 1.8% of the youth received medication treatment within a month. We see that 29% received behavioral health services only, and then the vast majority of youth, 68.9%, received no treatment at all after their opioid overdose. When I break it down by age, you see that it's overall pretty equivalent throughout the ages of the different adolescents. Um, the percent receiving medication gradually increased a little bit, so the 21 to 22 year olds, about 4% were receiving medication. Um, but you see that the vast majority still are not receiving any treatment. And I put over here on the right um, the study that I mentioned at the beginning of this section about adults and a similar, a similar sort of study was done. Um, and after adults had had an overdose, 16% had got medications within a month, 43% had behavioral health services. So only 40% of adults were not receiving any sort of treatment after their overdose compared to what we're seeing in the youth in, in my study. So really we're finding that youth with heroin overdose compared to other opioid overdoses have high rates of diagnosed substance use disorders and 2.6 times greater risk of recurrent overdose. Unfortunately, less than one third of youth received any timely addiction treatment after opioid overdose, and only one in 54 youth received the recommended evidence-based medications. So compared to adults, far fewer youth received treatment for 
Thus, we urgently need interventions to leak youth, link youth to treatment after opioid overdose with a priority place in improving access to recommended medication. So this led me to think about what are some ways that we can increase access to treatment for individuals after an opioid overdose. And it led me to do this policy analysis of a really innovative law in Massachusetts. So initiating treatment for opioid use disorder in the emergency room after someone comes in with an overdose has been demonstrated to increase access, improve retention and treatment, decrease opioid use, and overall is cost effective. And thus these protocols doing ED inductions of medication for opioid use disorder are starting throughout the United States. And Massachusetts became the first place to really pass in law um, that emergency departments have to be able to treat individuals coming in with an opioid overdose um, with opioid agonist medication, they have to have it available. So in my study, I wanted to characterize this law formation and understand the policymaking process, including the role of research, personal stories, economic considerations, and public health, and to gauge the stakeholder engagement and compromises that were made along the way, as well as to describe the plans for implementation, enforcement, and some challenges, and explore the ways in which the specific needs of adolescents and young adults were considered, if at all. And this was a policy level intervention. So I performed 10 key stakeholder interviews with people that were in the state legislative and executive branches, hospitals and physicians, related associations and advocacy groups. And the results that I found from the qualitative interviews was that the idea was really born of the governor's office as a way to increase access to treatment. And in this, compared to a lot of other legislation throughout the country, there was a really strong role of research that was more important actually than just personal stories and anecdotes. It was a collaboration across the branches of government along with the physicians and associations to really make this happen. There were some small compromises regarding feasibility and making sure the models could adapt to smaller hospitals. And the major concerns that were raised was really regarding whether there would be an outpatient network of providers that would be able to continue treatment for these people. And unfortunately, youth were really not considered throughout this process. So the goal of the study is really to improve guidance for other states that are thinking potentially of passing similar legislation. So thinking about that network of providers that may be able to continue to provide treatment after someone has had an overdose, I was interested in looking at the adolescent serving addiction treatment facilities throughout the US and the availability of medication for opioid use disorder specifically. So as we know, youth with opioid use disorder and overdose are significantly less likely than adults to receive the recommended treatment. But the extent to which the treatment facility characteristics contribute to this differential access is unknown. So my aims for this study were to describe the quantity and characteristics of adolescent serving addiction treatment facilities and to examine the associations between facility characteristics and offering maintenance medication. And this really looks at um, this part of the opioid use disorder cascade of care, the engagement in care and initiation of meds, and thinking about kind of community and policy level factors. I performed a cross-sectional study using the National Survey of Substance Abuse Treatment Services, an annual survey of all the addiction treatment facilities in the U.S. that's performed by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. So it covered all U.S. states and territories, and there were 13,585 addiction treatment So I looked at whether facilities reported that they offered a specialized program for adolescents, and I deemed these the adolescent serving facilities compared to those without programs, calling them the adult focused. The characteristics I looked at were the facility ownership type, hospital affiliation, insurance and payments accepted, accepting government grants, licensing, certification and accreditation, and the location. And then the services provided, I looked at the levels of care as well as whether they offered medication for opioid use disorder, distinguishing between those that offered only short-term medication, such as for detox, versus those that provided maintenance medication with either the opioid agonists, buprenorphine or methadone, or extended release naltrexone. I performed descriptive statistics and chi-square tests to compare the characteristics and services between the adolescent serving and adult focused facilities and use simple logistic regression to identify the characteristics associated with offering an adolescent program. 
Then stratifying by the adolescent serving versus adult focused facilities, I described the characteristics of facilities that offered maintenance medication. I used simple logistic regression to examine the association of a facility characteristic with offering maintenance meds and used an interaction term to test whether the facility characteristic associated with offering meds differed between the adolescent serving and adult focused facilities. I also created a scatter plot to examine the state level availability of maintenance meds for youth versus adults. Here we're looking at the characteristics of adult focus versus adolescent serving facilities. Among the 13,585 addiction treatment facilities in the US, 3,537 or 26% offered specialized programs for adolescents. The adolescent serving facilities were more likely than the adult focused facilities to be owned by a nonprofit or a state, local or tribal government, accept insurance or offer free and reduced fee services or to receive government grants. Now looking at the services offered, among the adolescent serving facilities, 23.1% offered maintenance medication for opioid use disorder, compared to 35.9% of facilities without adolescent programs. And while facilities with and without adolescent programs were equally likely to offer the opioid antagonist naltrexone as their only medication for opioid use disorder, the adolescent serving facilities were approximately half as likely to offer opioid agonist maintenance medication. Of the 3,537 adolescent serving facilities, 92% of them offered outpatient treatment, 11% offered residential services, and 3.6% offered inpatient treatment. Here we're comparing the characteristics of facilities that offer maintenance medication for opioid use disorder, stratified by whether they were adult focused on the left or adolescent serving on the right. Among the adolescent serving facilities, a higher proportion offered maintenance medication for opioid use disorder if they were nonprofit, hospital affiliated, accepted insurance, were accredited, were located in the Northeast, or offered inpatient services. We'll look at the associations more in depth in the following slide. Here we're looking at the odds ratios for offering maintenance medication for opioid use disorder, stratified, stratified by whether they were adult focused on the left or adolescent serving in the middle, and then the interaction term on the right that shows whether the relationship between the facility characteristic and medication for opioid use disorder differed between the facilities with and without adolescent programs. So facility ownership type was significantly associated with the odds of providing maintenance medication. And this relationship differed between facilities with and without adolescent programs. Among adolescent serving programs, nonprofits were 1.4 times more likely than for profits to offer maintenance medication. Whereas among adult focused facilities, nonprofits were about half as likely as for profits to offer maintenance. Being affiliated with a hospital increased the odds of offering maintenance medication in both types of facilities, though slightly more so among adolescent serving facilities. Facilities that accepted any kind of insurance, but especially private insurance, were significantly more likely to provide maintenance meds than those not accepting insurance or those offering free or reduced fee services. Adolescent serving facilities that were certified, licensed, or accredited by a state or hospital or a national authority were more likely to offer maintenance meds than unaccredited facilities. The relationship with national accreditation was even stronger among adult-focused facilities. Both adolescent serving and adult-focused facilities in the Midwest, South, and West were less likely to provide maintenance meds compared to facilities that were located in the Northeast. This negative association was strongest among the adolescent serving facilities in the South and the West. Lastly, adolescent serving facilities that offered inpatient services were more likely to provide medication than facilities without this level of care. In this figure, we're looking at the percentage of facilities in individual states that offer maintenance medication, comparing the adolescent serving facilities on the x-axis and the adult focused facilities on the y-axis. States are color coded by the US Census region. There are some patterns within the regions which matches what we saw in the prior slides, but with some more granularity here. So most of the blue northeastern states are clustered kind of at the top right quadrant with the highest percentage of both the adolescent serving and the adult focused facilities providing medications. Conversely, most of the orange Midwest states, the gray southern states, and all of the yellow western states fall above this line of symmetry meaning that a higher percent of their adult focused facilities offer maintenance meds in these states compared to the adolescent serving facilities. So 
So what we see in this study is that there's really a paucity of addiction treatment facilities available to adolescents in the U.S., with only one quarter of U.S. addiction treatment facilities offering programs for adolescents. There are particularly few programs that have the higher level of care with residential services. It's harder for youth to access medication as the adolescent serving facilities are half as likely as adult focused to offer maintenance meds. Thus, only 6% of all the U.S. facilities serve adolescents and offer maintenance medication. This is likely a result of societal and financial factors, including stigma against medication and an insufficient number of youth serving medication providers. So we see that adolescents have less access than adults to addiction treatment and specifically to inpatient and residential services or medication for opioid use disorder. And this is especially true for adolescents who rely upon free and reduced fee services or live in the U.S. South or West. And this study may explain why adolescents are less likely than adults to receive medication by demonstrating that the few facilities that serve them are also less likely to provide medication. We need strategies um, to increase access to addiction treatment, and these may include insurance reforms and incentives, facility accreditation, and geographically targeted funding. And the last study I wanted to show you about was looking at the access for opioid use disorder treatment facilities um, with special programs for not only adolescents, but we also looked at veterans and pregnant women um, and did a county level analysis. This used the same data source. Um, and in this study, we aim to look at the county level geographic distribution of the treatment centers providing medication for these vulnerable populations and identify regions where the burden of opioid overdose death was greater than the treatment availability. So we found that of the 3,142 counties in the United States, about 60% of them had some sort of opioid use disorder treatment facilities. But when you look at the facilities with tailored programs, there's only about 22% of counties with programs for veterans, 29% of counties had programs for pregnant and postpartum women, and 33% of counties had programs for adolescents. And we found that 54% of the counties that had adolescent opioid overdose deaths actually had no adolescent serving facility. So to wrap up, I wanted to go back to that slide from the beginning where I told you about some of the patients that I've taken care of recently and think about what are some of the key factors that tie into these gaps in care that we have right now. So we have teens that are coming in with repeated hospitalizations and not necessarily breaking that cycle. They just keep doing the same thing. Um, we have the importance of family dynamics, especially when there's family substance use involved. Um, we have problems with parental supervision that often comes with parents that are working um, two or three jobs or single parent homes. Um, we have the lack of available inpatient or residential treatment that's available um, for a youth in the state that we're in. We see that substance use disorders affect all types of adolescents, including those with severe um, medical comorbidities and that medication um, or that their substance use disorder can really impact their chronic medical conditions as well. Um, we also see that there are a lot of kids that have um, multiple substance use disorders. We see that depression, PTSD, other mental health conditions are highly comorbid. We see that patients are having multiple overdoses, multiple detox admissions, um, not getting the right treatment kind of the first time around. And we see that sometimes parents are worried about what is the best thing to do for their youth. They're worried about forcing them into something. And sometimes the youth aren't ready to change. So as we think about some of these gaps in care, um, I wanted to think about next directions in need. Um, so first, right now, while we're still in a pandemic, we need to be working on the adapting, adapting systems to COVID-19 and, and making use of telemedicine. We need to work on combating stigma and misinformation like I started at the beginning of the presentation talking about. I think we need to identify and address health disparities, which are really prevalent in substance use disorders. And recognize addiction is a pediatric disease that really starts during, um, during childhood and adolescence and e increase training for these sort of providers. We need to increase the pediatric primary care capacity for substance use disorder screening and early intervention, have hospital-wide protocols and really develop standards of care for youth presenting with substance use related conditions. We also need to increase the network of youth serving addiction providers in our community, making sure that we're paying attention to the developmental and family context and also being able to care for the co-occurring mental health disorders. 
And I think we need to increase the number of treatment centers for youth that need this higher level of care, which is something that we are encountering time and again right now in our, our current situation, at least in Maryland, um, and as we saw from my studies across the country. So to me, these are just some of the gaps. I look forward in the workshop to having some of you join me and talk about what are some of your ideas and the next directions and then ideas from this, this whole conference, really. With that, um, that is my presentation. I am happy to take any questions if there's time for it. Um, feel free to also email me um, and look forward to continuing conversations. Thank you. <laughs>